Well, good morning and happy Father's Day to the fathers and happy Sunday to all of you. It is good to see you. What a gong show that was. Um, <laughs> it's so good to have you back, Greg, and I look forward to many moments of laughing in the office with you. Um, before we uh, get into the message, though, I, I wanted to share a, a couple testimonies with you. Uh, one is a celebration uh, from our T-shirt Empowered Initiative, um, partnering with Johannes and Kara in Ethiopia. Um, so over the last few weeks, we have sold T-shirts, and the proceeds from those T-shirts is going to support our missionaries in Ethiopia as they minister the gospel to unreached people. Um, so I'm happy to report that we have raised $6,550 yeah. to support their ministry in Ethiopia. So praise God and thank you as well for generosity. Um, some of you bought t-shirts for a lot more than $35. Um, and so I'm just uh, so appreciative. And of course, they will be blessed by it. I will also have pictures uh, of when the pastors or new believers receive their Bibles. We're also gonna try to purchase one of those solar-powered uh, Arabic Bibles uh, for, for them to use there as well. So thank you so much for giving. Uh, secondly, I'd like to share a testimony from a congregation member that we have um, Amy Yang, I don't know if Amy is here, but I'm gonna read her testimony because um, I've got it here, written down and translated for us. So, so this is from Amy. I'm not gonna raise my voice to sound like Amy. I'm just gonna read it. Um, but she says, dear brothers and sisters, on the morning of April 25th this year, I suddenly couldn't get out of bed. I woke up with unbearable pain in my waist, making it difficult to move. This pain persisted until May 10th, along with difficulty urinating. On May 22nd, I experienced severe pain all over my body. My spine, jaw, chest, back, arms, and legs all hurt. At this point, we called 911 due to an emergency. A CT scan showed that my first lumbar vertebra and neck were compressed and one-third shorter. Not good. During this period, our church's pastors, brothers, and sisters prayed for me and encouraged me daily. On May 19th, Pastor Jen prayed for my healing. Now, she was at home. She couldn't come to church that Sunday, but her friends came forward to stand in the gap and to, be, uh, to receive prayer for Amy as she was at home. So her friends came forward and Pastor Jen prayed with them for her. A week later, my pain improved and I could finally attend church to listen to sermons in person. On May 26th, after the sermon, Pastor Joel and his daughter placed their hands on my back to pray for me. So this is me and my nine-year-old daughter. This is just a funny moment because I'm praying for her and I see my daughter there and I just say, Anya, you're praying now as well. After another week, I was completely pain-free and could walk independently. I cannot stop praising the Lord our God is real, he loves me, he loves you, he loves everybody. I cannot wait to share this wonderful testimony with you. Praise God, let's give God glory. Praise God. Amy, are you here? You are here, okay, hi, hi. <laughs> Amy is here, I thought she was here. I thought she was here, and thank you so much, Amy, for sharing. Uh, when I saw Amy come in the doors last week, she was like literally jumping up and down and, and laughing and smiling and so excited to share. Um, I will say that, that God has been, has been healing uh, lots of people in our congregation. This is now the fifth testimony that we have of healing. And just this morning, we had another testimony of, of God healing as well. 
And so I, I would just encourage you in this season as God is doing something, let's follow the cloud. Like if God is doing something, then we follow what he is doing. What we don't wanna do is do something else while God is doing something. We wanna partner with what he is doing and what he is saying and, and where he's prompting us and where he's nudging us. We want to follow him. The best thing you can do is get behind God and follow him. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So today I wanna talk about Empowered. We have been going through our series on Empowered. We began with being empowered in the upper room by the Holy Spirit. We continued our series being empowered to love, being empowered to heal, being empowered in generosity, and today being empowered for freedom, for freedom. The early church was marked by freedom. The early church was marked by freedom, renewal, and restoration for anyone who needed it. People from all walks of life could come to church to find healing. Even the location of the church says something about the kind of gathering, the kind of community that God was forming in the early church. I don't know if you knew this, but the first mega church was in the early days of God growing the church. Most people say that the mega church was created in the early 1900s, and in fact, one of the first mega churches that was started, many people say, was our founder's church, Amy Semple McPherson. Yes, she was a woman, and she had the first mega church called Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. The sanctuary even today, which still exists, seats 5,000 people. And many people think that this is one of the first mega churches that existed, but actually the early church was a mega church. And I don't know if you knew this, but the early church met in a place called Solomon's Portico, or Solomon's Colonnade, or Solomon's Porch. This was actually outside the temple, uh, the temple gates, it was 162 columns long, it was 800 feet, and it was a covered area that was outside but undercover. And it was undercover so that they could meet in the shade and they were out of the heat. And it was a place that had great acoustics so you could actually speak to a lot of people at the same time. It's in Solomon's portico that Peter would be speaking to 10,000 people first megachurch. This place could hold up to 30,000 people. But the thing about it that was unique was it was not inside the temple. It was not in a synagogue. It wasn't in a closed building. It was kind of open air. And so it, it became a place of debate, a place of discourse, a place where people would come with questions, a place where men and women would gather, kids would come, everybody would be welcome, Gentiles could come, people from, uh, like foreigners could come. Everybody was welcome at Solomon's portico. The early church was open and welcoming and loving and inviting in. And so everyone from all over would come to hear Peter preach. I think it's significant that the first church gathered outside the church. The first church gathered where the people were. The first church welcomed all people from all walks of life. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 to 16. We'll begin here. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade, portico, porch. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. 
Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their numbers. So if you remember in the early church, there was 3,000 people added day one. They baptized 3,000 people on day one and they just began growing. It's, it's probably up to 10,000 if you include men, women, and children. As a result, as a result of this growing and ever-increasing empowered church that was out in the public place, in the community, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. How many? There's nothing that's better to hear than all of them were healed. God was doing something supernatural in the church. He, he was moving in signs and wonders. So now we have something to add is we have the first mega church and the first Pentecostal church. I don't know if you knew this, but this is before there was denominations of churches, of which there's probably over 20,000 different denominations today. The first church was a church filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that welcomed everybody from all walks of life, and people would, would be so confident that they could bring their sick, their wounded, their in pain, their tormented, their diseased, their demonized to the church. They were so confident, they were traveling from all different places to this place, and people would be healed. They were so confident that the church was empowered and a place of freedom, they would lay their sick in the streets, hoping that as Peter walked by, his shadow might touch them. Think about that. Fathers and mothers waking up their, their sick child, traveling great distance, and laying their child in the street, hoping that as Peter is walking by, and hopefully the sun is at the right angle, like what if they laid him on the wrong side of the street? <laughs> Thanks, Dad, I thought you knew where the sun was coming, now I'm not in the shadow. But think about that, they laid their child in the street, hoping that as Peter is walking by, his shadow would be cast upon them and be healed. The expectation was high. Faith was high. Why? Because it was a church that expected signs and wonders. Now, a few weren't healed, some weren't healed, all were healed. In other words, you could debate whether it was all or some, were, but the point is the people were so expectant that they could bring their family members, their friends, their neighbors, their unsaved loved ones into the church and they would find salvation, healing, and deliverance. The church is supposed to be a place that people find freedom, healing, and deliverance. Why aren't the churches overflowing why are there empty seats in this service? One of two things are happening today in today's church. Either the church is not this kind of environment anymore, or the people in your life don't know about it. The church has become a classroom, and not everybody likes to go to school. If I say to my neighbor, why don't you come to church, what should I expect? Some decent music, 
Got good singers. All right, maybe. Then this guy gets up there, we call him a pastor, and he uh, shares a message. What are those like? Oh, he usually teaches from God's word some truth, and, and then we hopefully try to apply that truth to our life. Now, that's a, that sounds exciting to me, because I love God's word, and I love hearing preaching, and I don't know about you, but I love coming to church to hear God's word. But what if we added something to that? What if added to that was, oh, it's a place that we routinely see people completely healed and delivered. Really? Yeah, it's a place where people come each week and they're set free from their bondage. Really? Yeah, it was amazing. Like last week, somebody was brought in and they had a broken right leg and they were totally healed. Are you kidding me? I don't believe you. Just come. Because we expect God to move. And there's no plan B. See, I think a lot of what we have done as a church is we've made this other stuff like smoke and mirrors and stuff. And I'm not saying what we're, what we're doing is not important. I love it, I love it, I love it. But I think there's something that has to be added to it, which is what the early church had. Because the early church had preaching and the early church had teaching and the early church had singing of, of, of psalms. We read about them bringing their hymns into the church on the daily. So there was songs, there was teaching, but there's something that's missing. And what's missing is an empowered church where freedom is found, right. healing is found, deliverance is found, salvation is found, that the community would be so expectant that they would lay their sick at the door of the church, that as we come in in the morning on a Sunday morning, they would see their loved ones, their friends, their co-workers healed. There was nothing special about Peter's shadow. It's not actually Peter's shadow that healed. It was actually the one who overshadowed Peter. It's the one that casts the shadow. It's the one that shines above him. Psalm 91.1 says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Peter was in the shadow of the Almighty, which means he's in the shadow of Jesus, the light of the world. And as Jesus, the light of the world, casts his light, his glory upon Peter, Peter's shadow actually contains the anointing. We see this in the life of Paul as well. We'll read about this later on in Acts, but, but Paul sent his handkerchief to someone who was healed. Paul said, I can't get to this person, but but here's my handkerchief. Now, I, I don't believe in handkerchief healing or shadow healing as a ministry. I, I don't think we, I, I remember, you know, in some of the early days of studying healing, I, I remember somebody I was, I was journeying with in that time, and we were, we were going after healing everywhere we could possibly look, and I remember him going, I wonder if this works, and he's like, creating a shadow and like trying to heal someone with a shadow and like I think you can get kind of, you know, unless the Lord's doing it, don't do it, believe me. Like unless Jesus is asking you to walk on water, don't practice. Because what I've noticed, like 10 out of 10 times, people that try to walk on water have, have definitely gone under the water. But, but what I love about this was that there was such an expectancy such a faith that God was gonna do something that even the surrounding community thought if I could just get my loved one close, close, in the shadow, they'd be healed. Now I shared this a couple weeks ago when I was talking about healing, and I'll share it again, not everybody was really excited about the early church and all their miracles. In fact, the early church was imprisoned by the religious. Verses 17 and 18, when the high priest and all his associates 
who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. See, the priests were jealous and controlling. They wanted to control the early church because things had gotten out of hand. And so as they began to see the success of the early church and they began to see the growth of the early church, they decided to imprison them. The apostles were seeing a revival marked by conversion to Christianity, marked by signs and wonders and healing and deliverance. There's something about religion that is different from what was happening. Religion is rules and regulations, but no power. And religion will imprison a new move of God. But at the same time, be jealous of its results. Religion will reject what it cannot control. Some of you might have grown up in strict religious cultures. It might have been within Christianity. It might have been another religion. But some of you grew up in the strictness, that religious, the rules, do this, do that, and and regulations and tradition and a certain way of doing something. But religion is rules and regulations with no power. And the religious imprisoned them and they put them into prison. But God decided he didn't want them in prison. In verse 19, we read about God setting them free. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priests and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. I don't, we don't know what happened exactly here, but, but the apostles are locked up, they're imprisoned, the doors locked, guards are set, Next day, they're out. They walk through the walls. Did they elevate through the ceiling? We don't know, but the point is is that God decided they weren't gonna be in prison. See, sometimes God calls us to go to prison. God called Paul to write most of his books from prison. God called Joseph to prison. God calls some people from prison. Some people are saved in prison. I'm not saying it's always the case, but this case, they were put in a prison that God didn't want them in. They were put in a prison, but God wanted to set them free. And I believe this is a picture for us today because I think that some of us have been put in a prison by other people. We've been put in a prison from words that people have said, lies that people have spoken. A couple weeks ago, we had an inner healing session, which has also been on the increase. We've had lots of people signing up for inner healing, and we've been walking people through that. It's about a a one and a half, two hour session that we have, prayer ministry, praying, trying to find what is the root issue that somebody is dealing with. Inviting the Holy Spirit to minister to someone. It's been tremendously powerful and we're seeing amazing things in these sessions. And I'm not gonna share obviously someone's whole story, but one thing he said to me that, that I thought of for this morning, especially on Father's Day, 
He shared that at 15 years old, his father passed away. And this moment where he comes to the body of his father, it's a horrific accident. It was just gut-wrenching. And he walks up to the body and he's going to look at his father and, and he's, he starts to cry, he starts to weep. He, and his mom looks at him and says, stop it. We don't show emotion. You deal with this in a different way, but you do not cry. In that moment, 15, he gathered himself and he just buried it. And he didn't cry. In fact, he never cried. Anytime there's a moment in life, you just, we don't cry. We don't show emotion. That's for weak. As we ministered to him, the picture I had for him was that in that particular area, he was still 15. He never grew up in his emotional maturity. In that moment at 15 years old, he was put into a prison, locked up, put away. And I felt that there are men here that can relate to that. Women as well, but particularly a, men from certain cultures, certain family structures, where you had to grow up because that's what life expects of you, but in some ways you're still a boy. I wanted to invite you to something this morning. I want to invite you to come to Jesus and ask Jesus, is there an area of my life? This is for all people too. Is there an area of my life, Lord, that I am still in prison? Is there an area of my life, Lord, that I'm still, look at this picture. It's a great job, Claren, by the way. I hadn't, hadn't seen this. But that's it. Is there an area of my life, Lord, that I am locked up? Still young, still a girl, still a boy, where I was told not to feel. Or maybe this one, this is a common one. Be strong. Yeah. Just be strong, will you? Be strong. Don't cry, be strong. Wait, strength and tears can't coexist? Have you met my pastor, Joel? Man, I wanna tell you something today, and I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but, but you gotta cry. You gotta laugh. You gotta imagine that you are that, uh, you know, a seven-year-old boy running through the mud, if you like that sort of thing, 
fully alive, fully feeling, fully free. Be set free from who somebody told you you should be. Come out of the prison. Be set free. Romans chapter eight, verse one says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. John 3, 17 and 18, for God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Our freedom has many facets to it. There's the freedom to feel, the freedom to be who who you emotionally are created to be. The other thing is a freedom from condemnation. I'll close with this point, but God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. Why not? Because since the fall of man, since Adam and Eve fell and sinned, and the world is fallen, we are born into sin. Every human being that has been born since Adam and Eve are born sinners. I'm sorry, Jacob. You're so adorable. I can't imagine you actually sinning right now, but unfortunately, Jacob, he's born into sin. In other words, we are born needing salvation. But not only are we born in sin, because we're born in sin, we are born condemned. We are born in prison. We are born in prison underneath the law of sin and death. So we are born as sinners. We are born condemned. We are born in prison underneath the law of sin and death. So when Jesus came, he did not come to condemn the world. Why not? Because we're already condemned. We are already condemned underneath the law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death. We are born sinners. We are born in prison and the ultimate reward of our sin is death. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that through him they might be saved. So if you are born in sin, you are born condemned, you are born in prison, you are born separated from God. So Jesus came to save the world from the prison they're born into. Jesus came to set us free from the prison that we live in. Now, if God didn't spend so much time condemning the world because they were already condemned, if God didn't send Jesus Christ to the world to condemn the world because they're already condemned, why is the church spending so much time condemning people? Let me read this again. For God did not send his son Jesus. For God did not send the church into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. We are the body of Christ. We are Jesus to the world. I know I said I would close on the last verse, sorry worship team, but I need to read this. I wanna read the job description of the church. It's from Isaiah 61, written 700 years before Jesus. Written 2,724 years ago. 
Spirit of the Lord is on me. Is the Spirit of the Lord upon you? Put up your hand if the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. What kind of news? Good news. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will re rejoice in your inheritance. And so you in will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours." This is not just the calling to Israel 700 years before Jesus. Jesus gets up and he reads a portion of, of Isaiah 61 again. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. And I believe today this extends to us. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon the church because the Lord has anointed the church to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent the church to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The same, the same prophetic word to Isaiah for Israel is the same prophetic word to Jesus over his ministry, is the same prophetic word to the church today that we would be a place of freedom, of healing, of deliverance. That as people come in, there would be there for no condemnation. for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is a prison mindset, literally. You're condemned and you go to prison. It's a prison mindset. Jesus comes and he unlocks the door and he says, come out from your prison. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're goodness and your grace is here. Thank you that you can be found. Thank you that your spirit is here and upon us, Lord. I pray as we respond in worship, Lord, as, as we respond with break every chain, I pray, Lord, that you would bring freedom to those that need it this morning, Lord God. You'd bring freedom to those that need it this morning, Lord God. Whatever prison, whatever place of bondage, whatever place of holding back, whatever place that has been stunted, whatever place that has been buried, whatever place that has been told, do not feel, do not react. God, I pray now, by your spirit, you would minister and set free, Lord, those that need it this morning. We come to you, Father, our good, good Father. The spirit of the Lord is upon us to proclaim good news to bind up the brokenhearted, to say it's okay to feel again. It's 
It's okay to be all that you were created to be. In Jesus' name we pray.